Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm presenting this work that I did along with my collaborator, David Nguyen. So I'm going to start by defining leisure activities as uncoerced activity engaged in during free time, which people want to do in either a satisfying or fulfilling way. And I'm going to start by asking you to think of one of your own leisure activities. One that's easy for me to think of for myself is watching television, and I'm not alone in this. A study measuring time use in the United States found that television was the most popular leisure activity, with people on average watching 2.78 hours a day. For me, TV provides an escape from worries and boredom, a shared activity for my friends and I, and makes me feel hip. At the same time, there is often a sense of guilt over, hovering over the entire activity with me thinking that I'm not being productive enough. And I like this example because it shows how complex feelings towards leisure activities are and the ways that they are shaped by our individual motivations as well as the social, cultural, and political context. Leisure activities are beneficial throughout the lifespan. In older adulthood, they could provide a platform for self-expression and personal fulfillment and can be helpful during difficult times and transitions. There have also been a number of studies finding health benefits of leisure activities for older adults, such as a finding that dancing, playing instruments, um, and playing games are associated with lower risks of dementia. And finally, we know that leisure activities change over time as people age. So why should we care about leisure activities from the perspective of HCI? Well, recent work calls attention to the predominant focus in HCI on aging as a period of cognitive and physical decline, as well as health-related problems. As this conversation develops, there's a growing focus on technology for other purposes, whether financial, gaming, or creative engagements. And though in moving away from decline and health, studies have focused on individual leisure activities, we don't have an overall understanding of how older adults determine certain activities to be leisure activities or their motivations for engaging in them. So in this research, we seek to answer question, um, the following questions. What factors influence participation in leisure activities and how do participants decide which activities constitute leisure activities? To answer these questions, we conducted two-hour interviews in participants' homes. We took pictures of them engaging in different leisure activities as we asked them about their activities, and we recruited from four different independent living communities that ranged in income level and included places with subsidized housing. We had 24 participants, and the majority were female, which matched the demographic makeup of these communities, and we took a grounded theory approach to analysis. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of the leisure activities participants spoke about so you could keep it in the back of your mind for the rest of this talk. The vast majority described watching TV, reading, and playing games. And many described computer use, interacting with pets, gardening, writing, and learning as leisure activities. And some people had pretty unique activities, such as one woman who had this lifelong button collection that you can see here. Some activities were considered leisurely by some, and distinctly unleisurely by others, in particular, in particular exercise and eating. And in part, this was due to the ways that motivations to engage in leisure activities were negotiated in the context of other factors. So our findings outline two sets of factors that influenced the leisure activities that participants chose, as well as these participants' motivations for engaging in leisure activities. And I'm gonna talk about just a couple from each category, and you can see the paper for more details. So one of these factors we're calling societal factors. We found that predominant societal narratives and attitudes towards aging affected how participants engaged in leisure activities. Interestingly, participants used leisure activities as a way to maintain physical and cognitive abilities. Engaging in activities such as crossword puzzles and mahjong to preserve cognitive abilities in pursuit of what is colloquially referred to as the use it or lose it mentality. P22, who's in this picture, said that crossword puzzles start on Monday very easy. If I can do a Saturday, I feel like I've conquered the demons of old age. And this idea of defeating age through activity has been found in other studies, where older individuals discuss continuing to engage in, for example, competitive sports out of fear of becoming old or dependent. 
Participants describe learning about the different activities that would help them maintain their health through a variety of information sources. And this is consistent with other studies that have found that ideas that older adults can and should engage in activity to counter physical and cognitive changes dominate the biomedical and media discourse. And participants described others who did not adhere to the use it or lose it mentality. So P22, the participant I spoke about earlier, told me that she, is having a, she has a friend who's having trouble remembering things. She said that she was angry because her friend is not following her advice in using crossword puzzles to stave off these cognitive changes. And we can draw on the literature from social and critical gerontology that note the overwhelming emphasis in the media and biomedical literature on individual responsibility to stave off decline. So in other words, in this view, people are seen as entirely responsible for maintaining their physical and cognitive abilities and are disparaged when they do not or cannot do so. Another societal factor we, that we found affected selection of leisure activities was the concept of age-appropriate activities. This included ideas around activities that participants should and should not engage in because of their age. As an example, participants seem to be responding to this dominant idea that there is no point in learning in older adulthood. While some use this to explain why they didn't try to learn new things, others acknowledged and then dismissed the idea, such as P13 shown here, who said, even at my age, I still enjoy learning. And like with the use it or lose it mentality, participants set their own engagement in activities in contrast to others. P2 described how excited he was that the activity director had bought a computer for the activity room because he found what he described as the hobby type activities that people typically engaged in really boring. He said, I've seen too many pictures on TV where all the old people are sitting there doing this and I'm not ready completely for that yet, maybe 10 years from now. In this example, we can see how in some cases leisure activities were seen as negative and rejected just because they're associated with older people. And further, these activities were thought of as something to do in the future, even if they didn't suit personal interest once those individuals became old enough. Our second finding, set of findings was a number of ecological factors associated with engaging in leisure activities, one of which I'll talk about. We found that ecological or environmental and logistical factors affected how individuals engage in leisure activities, and access to transportation was the most significant factor identified by participants. A number of participants spoke about how they had recently stopped driving, and as one participant explained, it really confined you. Even when public transportation or shelves were provided by the community, some participants spoke about how they often only seated one or two wheelchairs or walkers. Participants spoke about how access tra to transportation affected the qualities of the leisure activities that they were able to engage in. For example, losing the sense of spontaneity when you had to book a shuttle in advance. And transportation also affected how some participants defined their own leisure activities. P8 said that currently she didn't attend most of the activities at her community because they were very sedentary. Instead, she liked to drive to go hiking with her friends. She said though that I'm pretty sure that I'll enjoy doing those things, the sedentary activities at her community, when I can't drive. For P8, what she considered an enjoyable activity shifted with her ability to access it. Societal and ecological factors provided a backdrop against which participants negotiated motivations to engage in leisure activities. The motivations we identified drawn and expand prior work by D. Shooter, and I'm gonna talk about just two of these motivations. One motivation we identified was for connectedness. Living in close proximity to others is a distinct feature of independent living communities, and some studies have identified this as the reason that some people move to them. And many participants describe visiting and connecting with friends, both within and outside their particular community, as one of their leisure activities. Others identified activities that didn't appeal to any of their other interests, but were considered leisure activities solely because they satisfied this desire for connectedness. So P16 said, though she hadn't played since she was 10, I started going to the bingo games here, and they are stupid and idiotic, but they are fun. The people she played with are nice people to be with, and that is essentially what it is. Interestingly, participants also described fulfilling the need for companionship through other non-human forms, in particular through pets and technologies such as the television and radio. P15 described herself as a people person and said she watches TV more than any other activity because 
mainly because I like the company that it gives me and to hear other voices and have somebody around. So those so some participants who use technologies for this purpose actually desired more human contact that they weren't getting. A lot of them actually preferred to get contact. They were satisfied with the amount of human contact they had, and they enjoyed having these alternative forms of companionship. Another motivation we found was, for a, for, was effective and escapism. Activities were enjoyable when they were entertaining, relaxing, or distracting. And sometimes activities that satisfied effective and escapism motivations were explicitly contrasted with those that satisfied other motivations, such as learning. P5 talked about how she felt wound up all the time from visiting her husband with dementia and nursing home frequently. She said that reading was her most frequent leisure activity. And she described the book she read as junk and as escapist and explained that the books she read are not intellectual, but I don't think I could even cope with anything that I really have to study. I just want to relax. And the only way to do that is to read these books. Though participants sought out activities that were entertaining, relaxing, and distracting, many of them described setting limits around time spent engaging in these activities. Setting limits on these activities seems to be how they were able to distinguish their own engagement in them from the other older adults they told me about, the ones who watch TV day in and day out. I'm now going to talk about three design implications that emerge from this paper. First, we offer additional motivations and factors to consider that researchers may not currently be targeting with older adults, such as accomplishment and escapism. We also offer nuanced views of some of these motivations that are already being targeted. For example, though connectedness is often looked at as a motivation in technologies designed for older adults, this is usually done in the form of human companionship and sometimes robot companionship. But participants also described a sense of connectedness from technologies that they didn't directly engage with. Researchers have examined the ways that interactive televisions can facilitate connections with friends and family. But we can also look into the particular kind of company provided by, for example, the background sounds of a television. Additionally, we argue that many leisure activities of these participants were intertwined with health and wellness activities. For example, the choice of crossword puzzles to maintain cognitive abilities. And this was initially surprising to us because we specifically chose the contacts of leisure to move away from the topic of physical and cognitive decline in older adulthood. We argue that in responding to recent challenges to HCI researchers to move away from this hyper-focus on health concerns of older adults, we must take a nuanced view that has space for older adults' own motivations and goals, whether these come from motivations to maintain abilities or from internalized societal narratives. And finally, we have a tendency to turn to individual challenges that older adults face such as challenges in technology user motivation in our design of technologies. And this has been a useful and beneficial approach. But when this is the only approach that we take, it can reinforce damaging narratives that overemphasize the importance of ability and at the same time position older adults as solely responsible for maintaining these abilities. With this as a dominant view, it's easy to see how a participant could arrive at the um, at the idea that her friend is at fault for developing cognitive impairment because she's not engaging in enough crossword puzzles. But this overwhelming focus on individual responsibility neglects the influence of other factors, such as access to medical care, assistive technologies, or walkable sidewalks, natural changes associated with aging, and even damaging stereotypes around what older people can and can't do. We can expand our research and technology design to include tackling some of these societal and ecological factors. As one example, HCI is well positioned to look into transportation options for this population, as some researchers have begun to do, as well as platforms for challenging stigma. I'm going to quickly recap the main takeaways of this talk. Leisure activities are influenced by societal factors such as predominant views of aging, with significant implications for the adoption and abandonment of technologies that older adults may see as stigmatizing just because they are associated with older adulthood. Second, as designers, we can be aware of the incredible complexity of how older adults decide what constitute leisure activities and what leisure activities to engage in. And finally, we can recognize the importance of expanding past solely focusing on individual responsibility and challenges to include the broader context in which people negotiate their leisure activities. Thank you.
time for a few questions, if anybody has any. Um, Jenny Waycott from the University of Melbourne. Thank you for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, I just wondered if you could comment on the age range of your participants. I think you said they were 60 to 96, and that's a 36-year age range. So I wondered if there were differences in participants' responses. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that is a great question. I know that we've there's been a conversation developing of criticizing the idea that we can take people that um, are diverse across four or so decades and lumping them into one group. So participants, um, we didn't look specifically by age. The ideas around someone else being older than me and I don't want to do what they're doing was common across the age group. So from the kind of younger to the older. Um, and most kind of mentioned, this came up across the age groups. What I'd say was different was some of the access. So the people who stopped driving were typically the older participants in the group. Hi, um, Clara from UC Irvine. Um, you said that you, um, your participants came from different, uh, like a wide range of socioeconomic status. Uh, I, I'm curious whether you saw any differences between like the different uh, places that you went. Yeah, thanks. So we didn't um, analyze specifically by that. A we looked at kind of financial barriers described by our participants, and interestingly, financial barriers weren't didn't seem to be significant in access to leisure activities, not other kinds of activities or, or kind of health concerns. And people instead spoke about kind of navigating successfully by switching out activities. So people spoke about instead of buying books, they'd go to the library. Instead of paying to go to the theater, they would usher out a show. And that was kind of across the different communities we looked at. 